Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for an overview of anti-lobbying regulations for federally employed scientists. Just a few housekeeping items to get us started. There is a chat box um, in the menu on the right-hand side of your screen. Please feel free to use that throughout the session. Um, that's a great place to ask questions. We'll address them as we can during the presentation, but we'll have time for Q&A at the end when we'll be sure to address the questions that are in the chat. We will also be recording, and this will be archived online in case you'd like to watch it at a later date or if anyone else has missed it and would like to see it in the future. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Please feel free to use that chat feature throughout the presentation. I'm excited to announce our two speakers we have today, Lauren Kurtz and Augusta Wilson. Uh, Lauren Kurtz is the Executive Director of the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund. Prior to joining CSLDF, Lauren was a litigation associate at Dietrich LLP. Lauren has a JD and a Master's in Environmental Policy from the University of Pennsylvania. Augusta Wilson is a staff attorney at CSLDF. Before joining CSLDF, Augusta was a fellow at NYU Law School's Gariani Center on Environmental, Energy and Land Use Law and a staff attorney at the Clean Air Council. She received her JD from Cornell Law School and a BA in Biochemistry from Case Western Reserve University. And a little bit about the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund. It's a nonprofit organization that provides free legal advice and representation to climate and other scientists who have legal issues as a result of their work. CSLDF also works to educate researchers on their legal rights and responsibilities. I'll be your moderator today. My name is Elizabeth Landau. I'm the Assistant Director for Public Affairs at the American Geophysical Union. And part of my work is ensuring that scientists have the information necessary to engage with policymakers um, and to speak up about their science. In recent years, um, an increasing number of scientists have found themselves involved in legal discussions about their work, um, their correspondence, and also public statements. So we hope to better prepare the scientific community for these challenges. AGU and CSLDF have joined together um, for the past seven years or so to create the Legal Education for Scientists program. It, this includes webinars, events at fall meeting, and online resources for scientists. We have another webinar in this series, which is an overview of anti-lobbying regulations for federally funded scientists, which will be Thursday, November 1st, from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we hope you'll join us for that or share with your colleagues who might be interested. I do also want to note that we have um, a couple of fall meeting events uh, for those who will be joining us at the AGU fall meeting this year. We'll have two workshops, one of which is about how to get involved in the rulemaking process, and another is how to become an expert witness in climate litigation. We'll also have some one-on-one -on -one sign up sessions available where you can speak um, individually with an attorney. Um, these 30-minute consultations will allow you to ask any legal, request, legal questions regarding your scientific work. So with that out of the way, I'm going to hand it over to Lauren and Augusta. Thanks, Liz. Uh, we're really glad to be here. This is Lauren. I will start off. Um, just with a few uh, words about CSLDF, um, as Liz said, you know, we're here to help climate and other scientists, not just climate scientists who find themselves with legal concerns or questions related to their work. We've helped a variety of researchers deal with a whole range of issues. We were actually founded in 2011 as a PayPal page to help crowdfund for the defense of a climate scientist whose university sort of um, left him out to dry. And in the years since, we've really expanded what we work on to not just help um, public university professors, which is sort of what we started off doing, but help um, federally employed scientists, help federally funded scientists, scientists at private institutions. We have at times helped scientists outside of the U.S. So it's a whole range. Um, and we're here to talk today about anti-lobbying laws, um, as scientists get more publicly engaged and get more interested in advocacy and activism, we have seen um, a handful of incidents that are concerning where they have been accused of violating anti-lobbying laws. Um, 
one good piece of news as we'll talk about is as a federally employed scientist, it's actually pretty hard to violate these anti-lobbying laws. There are a lot of areas of leeway, but um, more likely is being accused of some sort of impropriety, some sort of impropriety because there was some fuzziness about what you were doing or there was some ambiguity. And so our main goal here is to one, tell you, you know, the things you really cannot do. And then to talk about the things that, you know, are a little more of a gray zone and how you can um, present yourself and what you're doing in a way that is most likely to keep you out of trouble and, and not create any questions if there's anyone who's unhappy with the, um, you know, the statements you're making or the work that you're doing, which I hope does not happen. But if it does, please call us. We'll list our contact info at the end, and we're always happy to answer questions or, um, you know, try to find scientists' uh, resources or, you know, if need be, connect them with another group who might be better situated in that particular situation. So I will just start off with uh, what is lobbying? And the basic definition is attempting to influence a politician or public official to create a particular legislation um, or conduct a particular activity, um, things like voting on a specific bill, writing a specific bill, sponsoring a specific bill, voting, for example, on a Supreme Court nomination, um, you know, taking a really concrete uh, definitive action in a way that benefits a particular organization. So for example, if you work in say the healthcare industry, asking your congressperson to vote in a certain way related to healthcare reform, um, you know, by and large, would probably be lobbying. Um, if you work in, for example, geosciences and you ask your congressperson to vote some way on the healthcare bill because you care about this issue, that is not lobbying. So that's not even really a concern. The other aspect to this is, um, as a federally employed scientist, if you're operating under the umbrella of your agency, there's a lot that you can do that is considered lobbying and is totally cool. Um, the Anti-Lobbying Act really only um, per seeks to prevent individuals or organizations from using government funds to lobby um, to seek more government funds. So the quintessential no-no would be to use government money to get yourself a ticket to DC to go ask your congressperson for more money. Um, and I think, you know, ethically, it makes sense why that would be prohibited. But there are a bunch of things where that can sort of fall under that definition, and that's what we want to advise people again. Um, one thing that, um, sorry, just skip the slide there. One thing that I will mention is that if you're a federal grantee, uh, if you receive, you know, NSF funding or NHS funding, that gets a lot trickier. There are a lot more regulations about how um, you can use your federal grant money to, um, you know, interact with Congress. And we will be talking about that, as Liz said, on November 4th. So please tune in for that if you're a federal grantee, because um, unfortunately, there are a few more restrictions in that space. Although, again, it's more of an issue of... Um, portraying yourself in such a way that it's very clear that you didn't violate the laws because the number of things that you can't do, even as a federal grantee, is relatively limited. But there are situations that, um, you know, make it easier for people to make accusations that you were violating anti-lobbying laws. So that brings me to Dr. Linda Birnbaum, who is a federal employee. She's actually director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And um, you may have read she was in the news earlier this year because she got accused of anti-lobbying. Um, specifically, what she did is that she wrote an editorial um, in, I believe, Science Magazine saying that, um, you know, studies have come out in recent decades showing that the regulations that we passed a while back for various toxic substances and pesticides, et cetera, are perhaps behind the times and we realize that these compounds, some of them at least are a lot more dangerous than previous research had indicated. And then in the last paragraph or so, she had a sentence or two that said something like, it's important for citizens to work with their government to pass better laws, which is, a, in my opinion, a totally reasonable statement. But, um, you know, this did get her in hot water with, um, 
certain Republicans on the House Science Panel, specifically Lamar Smith, who in general has been um, a rather, let's just say, contentious figure in some of these areas. Um, and so he called for an investigation of her claiming that she had misused her federal position to um, promote lobbying. Augusta will talk in a minute about why this particular call to um, you know, citizens was really the sticking point. You know, not that she said we need better laws, but the fact that she called other citizens to urge their lawmakers for better laws, not specific laws. So I think it's not lobbying because she didn't ask for any particular action. But it was really the um, quote unquote call to arms, I guess, that so upset him. Um, you know, nonetheless, um, as far as we can tell, the investigation hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, there was obviously a bit of a backlash because her statement, I think, was mostly seen as pretty innocuous. Um, nothing seems to have happened, but I'm sure it was a very unpleasant experience for her. And it's certainly something that we want people to be aware of so that they don't have to go through anything similar. I'll also just go into another example of something that we personally worked on, which is a couple of years ago. Um, a number of scientists, and they were more federal grantees than federal employees, but they got into hot water and accused of violating anti-lobbying laws because they did some actions as private citizens, and then they publicized it on their department website and social media accounts, and so it blurred the line between what they were doing as private citizens and um, what they were doing ostensibly as part of their professional role. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, if you're doing something as a private citizen, it really behooves you to make that clear. And it also saves you a lot of potential heartburn with your employer. Um, every employer has a different take on this and some of them are very permissive and some of them are not. The federal government, I think in general, encourages people to do things as private citizens when they don't have agency authority to do so. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about ways just to make that distinction clear and help you stay out of trouble with your employer. Great, and hi, this is Augusta. Um, as uh, got mentioned at the beginning, I'm a staff attorney here, and I'm going to pick up the conversation with diving in a, a little bit more specifically into you know, what is it and is it probably not okay for a federally employed scientist to do um, with respect to anti-lobbying laws. Um, so one of the really big takeaways I think everybody should have is that while the federal anti-lobbying laws are very broad in their language, they have been interpreted relatively narrowly. And so ultimately, um, there's, there's, as Lauren has said, there's quite a bit that really is okay. <laughs> so uh, you'll see here, we've kind of listed out um, what are the things that it is actually fine for federal employees to do, generally speaking, without running afoul of anti-lobbying laws? Federal agencies are permitted to, in fact, directly lobby Congress in support of their um, administration or agency policy positions. Um, agency officials can use public speeches, appearances, public publications to advocate for specific agency or administration policy positions. Um, and they can also communicate directly uh, with the public via private communications, such as emails, um, letters, mailings, things like that. Um, where there has tended to be trouble, and in fact, most of the most recent um, examples of situations where there have been accusations of violation of anti-lobbying laws have involved um, agency officials using social media to encourage the public to contact their congressional representatives to vote in a particular way or to support a particular rule or agency policy or position. And so the, the reason that tends to be problematic is that what is not allowed is for a federal employee to engage in a substantial grassroots campaign. And those types of social media outreach methods have been considered, at least in some circumstances, 
um, a substantial grassroots campaign. Um, and it's interesting, I'll, I'll just note quickly that um, there are sort of different bodies responsible or involved in interpreting and enforcing anti-lobbying laws. And in fact, they, they look at this slightly differently as it turns out. Um, the, the one is the Government Accountability Office and the other is the Department of Justice. And DOJ has not updated its policy since the 90s, I believe. Um, so perhaps it should be updated. And, and just a quick note, just for interest, um, DOJ tends to focus in considering whether something is a um, significant, substantial grassroots campaign on how much has been spent in federal dollars on that campaign. Whereas uh, GAO, the Government Accountability Office, tends to be much more focused on any call to action put out through some sort of mass communication, such as social media um, or you know, a major emailing campaign that calls upon citizens to contact Congress. Um, they don't care so much how much is spent. They just care about asking citizens to get in touch with their representatives. Um, so, and the final thing I'll note before I move on from this particular slide is that um, generally speaking, it's going to be fine for a federally employed scientist to engage in personal advocacy um, as long as he or she does so on their own time and using their own resources. Um, so to the extent that you know you want to participate, go to a protest, um, sign a letter, um, call your representative and uh, ask him or her to, to take a particular action, um, you probably can do that as long as you do so on your own time and not using federal government resources like computers, phones, printers to do it. Um, so that kind of leads me into some of our best practice recommendations. And we, you know, as I have often said, we're we're taking a pretty conservative approach in making these recommendations. And but so we just want to sort of give some pointers if you do want to get involved. What are things you could think about doing to be the most protective of yourself and to try to minimize the possibility of any negative repercussions. Um, so as I was just mentioning, you know, it's important to make sure to use your own funds and resources and to the extent that you want to engage in advocacy and to do so on your own time. That's the safest bet um, to prevent any trouble. Um, be sure, and this is a pretty important one, it's really helpful to keep your email and social media accounts separate. Um, so try to make sure that if you do want to post um, something online um, that's entering into the political fray, um, be clear uh, about the fact that you are doing so as a private citizen and expressing your own personal opinions. Um, be very hesitant and careful about posting anything like that on um, an official agency account. Uh, that's certainly where um, trouble might arise. Um, so, you know, to the extent you want to uh, engage in activism, um, it's helpful to make sure, as I mentioned, that you're using your own devices, your own personal computers, phones, other electronic devices. Um, and, you know, as I've been, I've been referencing, you know, make it clear that you are speaking in your own personal capacity versus as an agency employee, if that's what you're doing. Um, you know, if you are, in fact, representing an agency position in having a discussion with a congressperson or a staffer, um, make sure that's cleared from your agency. And if it is, then that's probably fine. But to the extent that you are expressing a personal opinion, make that clear and that will be helpful to you. And similarly, um, consider including disclaimers, um, such as making it clear that to the extent that your title and institution, institutional affiliation is included in um, a letter or a petition that it says it's for identification purposes only, um, expressing that these are my personal views, not those of my organization. Those kinds of disclaimers can be very helpful as well. Um, and finally, it's really helpful to just 
proactively make sure you understand any policy your particular institution agency has about political speech and speaking to the press. Um, you know, making sure you're engaging with your HR folks or whoever handles that can be very helpful to make sure that uh, you stay on the right side of the line. And um, so there aren't that many don'ts <laughs> as we have been mentioning, but um, you know, the, the the major thing to keep in mind is to be sure not to use any federal agency or other government affiliate, affiliated accounts, social media accounts, email accounts to promote or oppose specific legislation or advocate for a specific appropriation of federal funds. Um, and this, you know, I was kind of already gone through this, but it's very helpful if you don't um, sort of mingle your personal and professional roles to the greatest extent possible. So, um, you know, if you are, for example, participating in some type of activism or advocacy, you are meeting with a congressperson to express a personal view, or you are going to a demonstration, and, you know, consider not wearing a sweatshirt with the logo of your agency on it. Um, and that will be very helpful to you in making it clear that you are acting in your individual capacity as a citizen. So we thought it might be helpful to run through a couple just quick sort of hypothetical examples to illustrate. Um, and this first one that I will talk about um, touches on an issue that we we have become aware comes up from time to time. Um, one of the specific intents of all this anti-lobbying legislation is to ensure that an agency does not engage in lobbying that it otherwise could not do via the path of hiring some outside private party to engage in a grassroots campaign that the agency itself couldn't do. Um, and for that reason, um, you know, one thing that it's important to be cautious about and, and be aware of is that trouble can arise if a federal employee is offering uh, assistance to some private or outside third party in conducting a grassroots campaign. Um, so here's a hypo. You're a federal scientist and you receive a call from a professional society asking you to help them prepare materials they want to distribute and to encourage the members of this professional society to contact uh, their congressional representative about a particular piece of legislation or legislative issue. They want you to help out with this. Um, this is an area in which you should probably be somewhat cautious. It's probably okay to point them to publicly available information, um, but to help them write new documents or provide them um, with mailing lists, labels, uh, other administrative or substantive assistance, is definitely getting into, uh, at, at a bare minimum, a gray zone. Um, if you are very clearly doing this on your own personal time and with your own resources, that may be okay, but um, this kind of scenario is one in which we would encourage you to be somewhat careful. Um, so uh, another hypothetical. Um, you're a federal scientist and you really care about an issue that's happening in the news, um, a particular bill that is before Congress, and you wish to send out a tweet to all your followers in which you encourage them to call their representatives and urge those representatives to vote against this particular bill that you care about. Um, this is another area in which we would encourage some caution. Um, if you are doing this from your own personal account, um, and clearly as an individual expressing your own personal view and it is an issue, a bill that is unrelated to your work, uh, this may be okay, um, but especially if it relates to your agency or, you, or your work or will directly affect your work in some way, um, probably not very advisable to put something on social media explicitly encouraging people to call their congressional representatives about a bill and, and urge them to vote a certain way. Because, uh, you know, as we were mentioning before, those types of social media campaigns um, have been problematic in the past and 
Uh, so it's just an area in which to be cautious, for sure. Um, so we wanted to, to sort of just mention to everybody some resources that we have developed here um, at Climate Science Legal Defense Fund that you know, we want everyone to know are out there and which can be very helpful in a variety of situations as Lauren described. We've, we've helped scientists who are confronting all kinds of scenarios. Um, so all of these resources you're seeing here are available online and we would encourage you to take a look at them. Um, they should be pretty readily downloadable. And this is our contact information. As Lauren said, you know, if you have any questions uh, at all, please don't hesitate to reach out. We are here and very happy to provide consultations, um, you know, discuss any situation you're, you know, you're confronting um, anytime. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Yeah. Thank you so Happy much. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Thanks to both of you. Um, that was a great overview, and we have plenty of time for questions. Um, anyone who'd like to ask a question, please go ahead and uh, type it into the chat box there, and we'll ask it. Um, I have a, a few here already. Um, the first one is, is it free to speak with an attorney at CSLDF if I have a question? Yes. It's definitely free. Um, yeah, we are a nonprofit. We get um, foundation and individual funding to provide legal support to scientists. Um, worst case scenario, if it's an area outside of our expertise, we um, will either suggest another group that can help you or try to find you some sort of resource. But certainly, like the initial conversation is free, and we don't we don't charge afterwards if if we are able to continue to help you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, if I work for DOE, can I ask Congress for more, more money for NASA or some other agency that I don't work for? Yeah, I think that would be fine. That's probably okay. I mean, I, it might be a little thorny if you have like a spouse there or something, mm -hmm. um, but that should be fine. And I would probably encourage um, before doing that, Sort of discussing with relevant people at DOE at your agency um, to sort of clear that and make sure. Yeah, that assume, assuming you're board. assuming you're doing that as a representative of DOE. If you're doing that as a representative of DOE, DOE like totally outside of the anti-lobbying laws, I think you just need sign off from mm. the people at DOE. If you're doing so as a private citizen, I think that's totally fine. Good luck. And that relates to um, another question, which is. Um, should I check in with my agency before I take action, which you just suggested? And then the follow-up question is, who do I ask at my agency? Um, so I imagine that is highly dependent on the agency. Usually the final signer offer on this would be in the general counsel's office, but I wouldn't necessarily start there, um, depending on your role. If you want to contact us with more specific information about your 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 position, we could help you sort it out. I'm sorry to have a more distinct answer. It's just, it's so agency dependent, it's hard to say. But if you want to email us, we can help you poke around and figure out who might be the person to start with. Great, thank you. And we also have the question, um, could my agency issue stricter guidelines or rules than what you've specified here? They can certainly do their own regulations outside of the anti-lobbying laws. Um, some agencies have their own interpretations. As Augusta said, the way that these have been inter interpreted have been a little funky. I'm aware of, for example, NOAA putting out some interpretations back in the 90s. I believe that the interpretation literally has a clip art picture of a man with a fax machine on it. Um, and NSF, I think, has a couple... I think NIH has done yeah. some of its own as well. Yeah, NIH is a particular interesting one because so many people in the healthcare industry do have sort of a toe in the lobbying world. But, um, yeah, they can certainly have their own interpretation of it that is on the stricter side. We have a – our I don't think anything we said here is contrary to what an agency has. But on, if you're talking about a very nuanced issue, they may have their own take on it. And, again, certainly if you want to contact us, we can help you figure out what – 
the deal is with your agency. Some agencies don't really have any guidelines too. In fact, that's actually the majority of them. Yeah, but when in doubt, I think it's always a good idea to familiar, familiarize yourself with whether your particular agency has a policy and if so, what it says, because it may it may differ somewhat from the broader yeah. federal interpretation. I would say that the most likely thing I think is um, agencies' policies on um, talking to the press and social media, which is separate from anti-lobbying, but I think still might affect some of these same sorts of issues related to putting on Facebook your, you know, opinion about the Kavanaugh hearings or, mm -hmm. you know, talking on some blog about how you feel about a health care bill. So that's not really the anti-lobbying laws, but there are more agency guidelines on some of those sorts of things. Yeah. I, I, as, as people may have sort of gathered, I, I think a lot of what we're recommending here has, in fact, slightly less to do with Tech, you know, the technicalities of anti-lobbying laws and more to do with saving yourself heartburn by treading into a semi-questionable area, even where it might technically be fine. Yeah. Uh, our next question is, um, if I'm presenting at a congressional briefing, uh, where should I draw the line about what I can and can't say? Um, so I would start off by saying I would assume if you're there in a congressional briefing, you're probably doing so as a representative of your agency. And I would hope that your agency is working with you because they probably have specific talking points they want you to promote and not promote. I don't, again, if you're not doing external facing shout outs to get citizens calling their congressperson, I don't see this as an issue and I don't really see how direct briefings would interact with that. If you're a federal grantee, which we didn't talk about today, there are more wrinkles in that and the sorts of things that you can ask for. Um, long and short is if you're a federal grantee, you have to be a lot more careful about asking for things that would directly benefit you or your organization. Um, although you can always talk about things of general import or talk to them about your research or provide an educational briefing. Yeah. But I mean, as I as I mentioned, and just to sort of just pick up their add on, um, it, it is per agencies are permitted to directly lobby Congress. Um, it's that's okay. So assuming that this has been vetted by your agency, it it, it should be fine. Excellent. I have one clarifying question, which is, how is personal capacity defined? Is that agency specific? I'm not sure the agencies really define it, mm -hmm. um, but there's certainly no outside definition either. We, I have generally seen that, you know, if it gets to the part where like a court is looking at it, then they're looking at um, whether or not you did this on your own time with like, you know, there's some exceptions for like de minimis, um, as they call it, you know, super, super minimal work involvement. So for example, if you like got a single email about it on your work account, that probably wouldn't sink you, but it's just, it's better to do things like, let's say you are organizing your city's March for Science. You would be much better served by doing that not on during work hours not on your work computer, not on your work phone, not scheduling meetings in your work conference room, things like that, not printing out flyers for the march on your work printer. I mean, if you had an email here or there, that probably wouldn't sink you, although, uh, you know, it sort of depends on your risk tolerance, and the more that you can shuffle into your personal time, the better. I know for certain, um, for certain roles, especially the professor type, there's Sort of a you're always on you're always working and so therefore you're never not working, but um, you know to the extent that you can say I was doing this as a private citizen in my own home on my personal time, the much better it is and the much easier it is for especially federal agency employees to be protected by things like the First Amendment to say I'm a private citizen I am petitioning my government or I'm you know associating with other private citizens, and so the government can't punish me for my First Amendment protected work.
Okay, great. So I'm on uh, our last question we have from the chat box right now. So if anyone else has a question they're thinking of, now is the time to type it in. This question is, what should I keep in mind if I'm participating in a Congressional Visit Day event with a scientific society that's generally asking about congressional offices to support science funding? So I would just say, I know AGU does a really terrific Congressional Visit um, series. Um, certainly, if you're more interested in that, Liz is the person to go to. Um, I think as an agency scientist, you know, that's fine. Again, you're totally entitled to lobby for Congress. I think it's more of a determination. Are you representing the agency? In which case, yes, there are some conversations you need to have with your supervisors about what you're discussing. Or I suspect more likely, are you talking as a private citizen um, and you're asking you know, generally for science funding? And I think that should be fine. We will, again, we'll talk on November 4th if you're a federal grantee. Um, I know if you receive an NSF grant or an EPA grant or something, you can't go to Congress and say, I want more NSF or EPA funding for the kind of research I do, that starts to get you in really hairy territory. But as a federal employee, because you're already allowed so many types of lobbying um, discussions with Congress, really it's just the, as Augusta said, it's really the external facing um, social media calls to get people to call their congressperson on specific bills that gets you into trouble. Um, and you can see situations like Linda Birnbaum where she got in trouble because she said, um, you know, people should talk to their congressperson about passing better laws, but that's an unusual situation. And, you know, doing these one-on-one -on -one congressional visits that are not public facing, I think should be totally fine. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question that came in, which is, what if I work for a state agency rather than the federal government? Um, what are the differences in the laws? That is a really good question. It depends on the state. Um, if you want to contact us, we can do more research in your specific state. But my understanding is that the state laws either track the federal government laws or are laxer. So, you know, if you're a state uh, agency employee, I can't, I don't know all 50 states off the top of my head, but you're certainly welcome to contact us and we can look up, you know, Wisconsin or Florida or whatever. But in general, they're similar. Yeah, but it is certainly the case that at, at least in most instances, there are anti-lobbying laws that do apply to state legislators. So it is, you know, it's it's wise to ask the question. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Excellent, thank you. Well, that has answered all the questions that came in. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to our presenters, uh, Lauren and Augusta. Um, what you presented today was really useful. Um, this will be online and available um, if anyone wants to rewatch certain portions to make sure they understood something correctly or if they want to share with others. Um, and Lauren and Augusta and the rest of the CSLDF team are available if you have questions. So thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope you will join us for the next webinar in this series, which is November 1st at 2 p.m. And thank you again. Have a great week.